Welcome. Welcome to Versus. Uh, I'm Alan Ng. I'm the editor-in-chief of Film Threats. Uh, normally, Chris Gore would be here, uh, but he's not. And uh, But uh, we're going to have a great conversation about the movie Civil War. Uh, in fact, this uh, this Versus will be the Civil War to start all Civil Wars in the YouTube community. No one can agree on this movie. So with that, uh, we are going to go to it. <laughs> All right, we've got a great panel of guests here to talk about Civil War. Uh, just before we do, remember to uh, like and subscribe to the uh, Film Threat YouTube channel. Uh, hit that thumbs up and over on Rumble, follow. But uh, let's bring our crew on board. Uh, we've got Script Doctor, we've got Ramesh and the DA, Derek. Uh, let's see, let's uh, just go around the horn, uh, introduce yourselves and uh, tell us what you thought. Uh, give us your quick... Uh, give yeah, just give us a uh, let's see. Actually, just introduce yourselves and then we'll go around the horn after that and give the quick review. So, we'll start off with uh, we got this. Go ahead, go for it. Hey, I'm the <laughs> hey, I'm the script doctor. <laughs> Super happy to be here with I all those it, bells dinging. I'm at waiting at the TTC to get back in uh, back home to stream with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what's up, everybody? Derek Anderson, the DA. Looking forward to this conversation. Should be epic. All right. Hey, Bun Iyer here. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to rumble on this uh, movie. Interesting. All right. Uh, bring us all back here. All right. Let's do this. Uh, let's get right into it. We're going to go around the horn. Uh, tell us what you thought of Civil War, and then gloves, gloves are on. All right. Uh, Derek, go for it. Um, for me, I loved it. I thought it was a really good movie. Um, you know, not perfect, obviously, but, uh, it's a good conversation starter. And, uh, one of the things I felt about this movie is really the reaction from this film is more interesting than the film itself. I think everybody's reactions, how the commentary has been, you know, you know, depending on what you brought into the movie, I think is how you are relating to this film. Um, it's kind of like uh, what Yoda said in uh, Empire. I was just thinking about this. It's like, you know, what's in there? What's in this movie? It's whatever you bring with you, you know? So if you brought a lot of baggage in with you to this film, um, that's going to color your experience of how you feel about it. So, yeah, I thought it was a good movie, though, and I kind of went in with a blank slate. I really didn't have any leanings one way or the other. I didn't know what the movie was going to be about. I watched, like, the trailer, like, one time, and then that was it. And I said, okay, I'm going to go check it out when it drops. And, you know, since that point <laughs> i've seen how the entire country seems to be divided on this film so it's really interesting it's a good film a good conversation starter all right go ahead uh, sure, doctor sure uh well this well if you're a fan of alex garland you'll probably really enjoy this i'm a little mixed on him uh i thought this movie uh definitely uh, conveys the level of pretentious attitude that alex garland has but i don't think that's necessarily a negative against the movie uh, it's a science fiction film that has similarities to Children of Men, and uh, and and it definitely has. Um, it's definitely more about the characters and what they're trying to accomplish, as opposed to uh, putting the world ahead of what's going on. The the setting of the conflict is really just the motivator for this other type of character arc that's uh, being handled here. It has a couple of convoluted points, but overall, I felt it was kind of a harmless thing, and I agree with Derek that the audience conversation is far more interesting than the movie overall. All right. And Ramesh, go for it. I would call it last of us 2.0. It's uh it's post-apocalyptic with more politics. I felt he did a disservice in that I, it would have made a great series and it was as a movie and eh, it's good. It's not great. I know Garland tries to be Kubrick, um, but unlike something like a uh, full metal jacket, which actually shows divisive sort of different points of view and asks questions. I don't think it asked a lot of questions. It just presented, uh, it just presented something and I saw it. I wouldn't revisit it. All right. So let me, uh, let me read a little bit about uh, what Alex Garland said about civil war from, uh, from South by Southwest. Uh, this was probably the most interesting part uh, for me about what he said. Uh, but he discussed the, the idea of audiences thinking for themselves. Uh, he talked about leaving gaps in his film, which provides space for actors 
uh, the DP production designers, and ultimately the audience to bring their own interpretation and insights. Garland believes that these gaps allow people to occupy that space if they want to, uh, which encourages audience to think and interpret the narratives on their own. Uh, and that this approach uh, is designed to enhance the viewer's engagement with the film by inviting them to contribute their own understanding and reaction to the cinematic experience. Um, let me ask you this, was this a good idea? And uh, you know, did he pull it off or well? That's just pretentiousness. I mean, that's the aspect, that's like the core of it there. It's basically saying, I'm not going to commit to something. I'm going to be rise above that. And I'm going to let the audience do the work that I technically should be doing. Now, given the, the type of narrative structure he was using here, he really didn't have to give a partisan political point of view in this story. He didn't really have to. We just needed a bit more of a core conflict um, and a bit more of a motivation for it. Because the, the th one thing that I did appreciate and I don't think a lot of people picked up on this is that these journalists are trying to just report on things and they're not trying to make the news and they're not necessarily trying to uh, skewer aspects of it. But that gets a little dicey towards the end, which I'm not going to I'm not going to spoil until you guys preface. That's when we can talk about it. But I think it's one aspect that I kind of appreciated is that you have um, these veteran journalists and this newcomer photojournalist coming in there and they're dealing with the, with what it is to be a journalist, which is to objectively report, not put a narrative spin on it, not be a pundit, just be there to record what is happening and let the, the, the readers ask questions and then go from there, let them drive it, which is something we haven't really seen much on the legacy media side of things for some, quite some time. And that's, that's kind of a nice little reminder we had there. And I really liked, um, I really liked the character played by, uh, oh gosh, his, names escaping me at the moment um he was in dune and we're cut out of dune um <laughs> so uh, it was not in dune <laughs> uh, Stephen mckinley hender thank you uh okay. <laughs> i really liked his character i thought he he was like a nice little um guiding post of, of things but yeah this i think what we have here is alex Gar this again um as i said before the show alex garland is in a is cut from the same cloth but has a different level of execution as it pertains to how they tell story uh, the same cloth of Christopher Nolan, of his brother Jonathan, uh, of even J.J. Abrams, as hard as that is to believe. And that cloth is that they come up with interesting ideas, but they don't put the work in to research what that idea is to get full verisimilitude out of their stories. There's a lot of people that have watched Interstellar or um, or, or uh, Super 8 or any other uh, J.J. Abrams films or, or Westworld's uh, Jonathan Nolan's television series um, where they're like, well, I know. Pro computer programming doesn't work that way. I know computer viruses don't work that way. I know space time doesn't work that way. I know dreams don't work that way. If you've got the expert saying, hey, I know that doesn't work that way. And it's a simple, you know, Wikipedia search to correct that. That's a bad thing because you as a filmmaker are trying to convince the audience overall uh, of this world and not have them be pulled back. And in this case here, one of the biggest flaws that I saw is that the journey is these these journalists are going from New York to Washington. And the states that have seceded are Texas and California with Florida making an attempt. So why is there um, combat and military mm -hmm. events going on between New York and Washington when those are part of the consistent union that should not be in conflict because they're so far away from the states in conflict in question? That threw me off. That didn't make sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I will say that he talked about in at, at South by Southwest the, the fact that this was this was set at the end of the Civil War versus the beginning of the middle of the Civil War. And I will grant you that that wasn't necessarily explained well. Or, or yeah, it, it wasn't. But it also seems kind of weird, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, if it's towards the end of the Civil War and there's these two states that have seceded, if no, none of the other states seceded and they're still there, why would there be heavy military activity? activity? Why are we not getting points of like, well, where's the rebellions and, and are there sleeper cells? And if they are, is the government, is the reason we're seeing all these military and, and National Guard and and whatnot everywhere because they're trying to smoke these guys out. We don't get any of that. So we don't understand the conflict. Overall, the general audience is going to be like, well, it's really the southwest side of the country that's got the problem here. And we're doing a story that's in the northeast. So why the heck are they going through these checkpoints? Why the heck are we seeing these camps? Why are we seeing all this military guard in an area that should have no issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that there were those moments in the film that kind of left you wondering, well, what's the answer to this question or that question? And it seems like it was kind of done intentionally because he didn't want to spell the entire conflict out for anybody. So let's right. come in, watch this. This is the story. It's a road trip from New York to Washington. 
and these four journalists and what they what they saw. And we're not going to give you anything more than that. That's it. That's all you're getting. And I thought that it was an interesting way to tell a story. Really not a story there, honestly. It's just this road trip. My, my fear was is that we were going to get a lot of, you know, to through it, uh, the journalists bloviating about their experiences and previous wars and how this is different from that and, you know, what they think should be happening and all of that stuff. And I'm glad we didn't get any of that. I'm glad we just got to be, you know, kind of flies on the wall as we are going along in this van or truck, whatever they were driving um, from one spot to the other. And we're just seeing, you know, the world, just like you were saying, Alan, we're seeing, you know, things without any kind of, you know, explanation you know, we're not giving you our opinions of what happened here. Why is this going down? You know, I was looking at it, too. Like the map is like, well, they were going through like these loyalist states or are these like, you know, are these uh, insurgent groups that are like still kind of fighting against this? Um, the loyalists, you know, is that what's happening here? But it doesn't explain any of that. And I love that. I love that about it. It's like, OK, I'm just here along for the ride and I'm just going to get the experiences of these of these journalists. That's that's what we're doing. And we're going to see it. And, you know, you start to get the idea as we go along that, OK, both sides are kind of doing nasty things, dirty things to each other. You know, there's the one scene and I don't know how deep we want to get, but the little Winter Wonderland scene where, the, you know, that was like kind of the comedic moment in the movie where it's like, oh. Uh, this is a guy I'm trying to kill. It, it, there was no side. They kept asking, what side are you on? He didn't answer that question. I, I liked that part of the film because it's like, OK, then we're right. We're not taking sides. And in this particular um, era that we're in, everybody seems like they want sides to be drawn. They want the lines to be drawn. They want to know who's, you know, like if we were to relate this to the real world, you know, well, what side is the government? Is the government on my side or am I on the government or I'm on the uh, the Western Front, you know, Texas and California? Like what side would my ideology fall on? And I'm glad that the director kind of steered clear of all of that. And it just says, look, here's the horrors of war. And I think that was ultimately his message, you know, that he was trying to get out there. He didn't really care about telling a story so yeah. much as just pushing that moment of, hey, don't go to war, you know, and that was kind of it. But um, I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it for what it was, you know, and I didn't go in with any kind of preconceived notions of what it should be. I just accepted what the director gave me and I enjoyed it. Okay, go ahead, Ramesh. Yeah, that's not his, yeah, his point at all is not about this divisive sort of tribalism that we're in now. That was not it at all. You know, let me back up. The two best scenes in the whole movie is that Winter Wonderland sniper scene why are who are you shooting? Why are you shooting? Because he's trying to kill us. And the second yep. one is what kind of American are you? I mean, yep. I think as as good as the film is, not great. I think that line is going to resonate as a great cinematic line for a long time to come. I think it's just those are two great scenes. Alex Garland is about telling stories that are trans about characters who are transformative that where things imprint on them and transformational, right? So that they transform in it. Those four characters are the same character. Sammy is, and I might get them wrong, it's Lee, right? Is Kirsten Dunst? Lee, yeah. Kirsten yeah. Dunst is Lee, Joel, Lee, Joel is, and Jesse, uh, and Sammy. And it's funny, one's called Joel, just like The Last of Us, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> Sammy is the person who cares more about himself at this point, right? And just surviving and not the shot. Lee is go is approaching that position. She is like, I'm done. She's breaking breaking down, right? She when she takes a picture, not spoiler alert, when she takes a certain picture, she deletes that picture later on, right? So the, you have Lee, you have Sammy, and then you have Joel, who is like adrenaline rush, right? He is where Lee used to be. And then you have the young one who is Jess, and Jess yeah. is becoming what Joel is, right? To the point where it's all about the shot. Even if I have to step over a dead body, which is interesting because if you hold a mirror of that on society, which I think Alex is, uh, is that it's like the Instagram, right? It's like TikTok. It's all about the shot. I don't care if someone's dying on the streets. I don't mm -hmm. care if there's a if there is a protest behind me and people have boarded up their stores. I'm going to take a selfie of me and that thing. That's the shot is everything. Right. And I think that's what he's talking about. But these characters are they're transforming. It's all I feel like it's one character and you're seeing four different four different uh, time periods of that same character in a way. Yeah. So, I mean, I I, I want to ask this question then. Uh, he's not taking a side. Um, 
I, I think a lot of the criticisms I've seen of this movie is uh, they wish they had taken aside that that was the president. Was that Trump or was that Biden? Um, you know, do you feel like uh, he was, you know, people say that he's playing both sides. People are saying he's not uh, bold enough to take a position. Uh, do you think he was right in not doing that with this movie? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't yeah. matter left or right. Totalitarian right. doesn't care about politics in that right. regard. A totalitarian finds its base, exploits them for their own purposes. That's the point. And the way that they did it cleverly here um, with Nick Offerman, who is, uh, has been in almost all of the Alex Garland stuff that he's done, I think, mo at least most of it, is he's like, no, he's a president who has decided to uh, have a third term, which is against the Constitution since after FDR, I think. And people are upset by that. And then we get one hint from Sammy that uh, with regards to what questions are they going to ask the president? And one of them is regarding the, that the president has actually killed U.S. citizens. Um, currently, on the left and right, we don't have any evidence to support that has happened in recent years. <laughs> like that's that, that's the thing. So he is giving us a science fiction dystopia where one person who has gained political power has actually violated the responsibility of their office and it has caused a divide and how they violated that. We have a couple of hints, but we don't know all the extent of the details. We don't know how far he has gone to uh, cause the civil war and cause the succession of Texas and California. And that's not really the point. The point here is that this is the situation we're in and we're looking at these four journalists at various stages within their career on a road trip to basically just, ask questions and try and get information out to the public so that they know that they can ask their own questions and, and be informed that way. I, I think that's the core of the story. And I think it was smart to do that because you want to be able to say that this is, that it's not a left and right thing mm -hmm. because again, any leader from any part can, uh, from any, you know, partisan part can eventually usurp and dominate for power it's never always just the one side in in recent centuries it's leaned more to one side than the other but the reason the other side hasn't probably gotten so far is because there's been that counterbalance or so and that's what's really important the counterbalance to prevent that type of totalitarianism yeah i think the um from a narrative standpoint and what people expect from a movie i think picking a side would have been better for a lot of people you know just you know, not for the what he was trying to accomplish in the film, but just from a narrative standpoint, from people walking in to see the movie and feeling like, OK, I know who the good guys and the bad guys are. You know, I think that's what everybody is like kind of missing. It's like, OK, that that key little story element is missing out of this film because we don't get to assign blame we don't get to say this guy's the bad guy. These guys are the good guys. What led to all of this? We have no idea. And I think that a lot of folks out there that are watching this are missing that little story nugget, you know, like, OK, now that I know what's happening, because I think a lot of people went in with that, you know, expectation. I want to know how this all happened. I want to know what went down, what caused this country to split apart. Give me the details. I want to know. OK, I think that's what the way a lot of the audience went into the film and then they didn't get that. You know, we just got four journalists going on a road trip and that was it. And so it's like, well, I don't know how to feel about this. You know, a lot of people wanted to feel certain ways about, you know, the, the, the conflict that was happening in this film. And they really couldn't get there because at no point in time did Alex Garland say, yo, OK, here's who's at fault. Here's the here's the blame. You know, point the finger at the president or point the finger at the, you know, the other forces or whatever. So I think that from you to answer your question, Alan. I wanted him to do. I'm glad he did what he did. I think it was a smarter choice. And again, it's led to the conversations that we're having and a lot of the, you know, well, who, what, where. I, I, I'm glad that these conversations are happening. But at the same time, from a narrative standpoint, that's one of the things that it does lack. It doesn't have like a very clean story. It's really not a story. It's just kind of a series of events that are happening on screen. Yeah. We get to experience those, you know, those moments along with the journalists, but that's all we're getting, you know? Yeah. And so it's a different I mean, kind of movie, you know, it's not like your traditional, you know, story. That, that was the point. He's creating an experience. Yeah. Right. Right. I like exactly. It, like, it to, uh, like Homer's the Odyssey where you're the protagonist moves from one story to the next. And, right. and, and each story kind of illuminates what's going on in the larger world. You know, you talk about walking dead, um, you know, there's there is an overall narrative, but each episode is kind of like 
okay, we're in this town and this is what this town is happening. Star Trek is another one of those where they go from one planet to the next and there's a story being told at each planet. And I think that goes to your point of whether this would have been a better television series than a movie. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's, a mini series, but this is really Jesse's or uh, yeah, Jesse's story because she goes from green yeah. journalist and then she becomes a, a far more she becomes the yeah, like she wants to be by the end. That's that's her yeah. character arc. Um yep. the idea is that the conflict is just part of the setting. It is not the driving force of the story. Yes. Right. Yes. And that's one people I think are are misconstruing when they watch this, where they're like, oh, it's about the actual civil war it's about the president and what they're doing like no it's actually about this this young photojournalist that wants to get a start gets meets one of her heroes who's also with one of her mentors so we got two generations of journalists ahead of her and she's learning from them on this one odyssey as you put it to become the the, the reporter she's always wanted to be and that's that's her story that's what it is and I will say this, I did love that. What type of American are you seeing? I do think, though, the scene leading up to that was the most convoluted piece of crap I've seen on, on screen in many, many years because it makes no sense. Which one was that? The, uh... That's the car chasing or the oh, car okay. speeding racing. Because oh, yeah. That was yeah. only there. It was there to be there. It didn't do anything else. It was to introduce these two characters that, you know, bad things are going to happen to them literally in the yeah. next scene. See, it's and funny. I, I disagree with you on that. I, I, I feel like that's fun, but it doesn't logically make sense. It's like if you want to do something dramatic and tense in this time frame, just have them go up and be stopped by that patrol and then forced right. to get out of their cars. That's right. all you got to do. I think, you you, I think they did that to oh, put Jesse in that away. other car. <laughs> yeah, no. Me, I think me, that was like, that. That's literally it. Yeah, he's right. It makes no sense. And they no, literally did it just to get Jesse in the other car so that, you know, and it's to set that scene up so that they can have that conversation when they were rolling up and, you know, peeking around the, yeah, the van or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. To to the to get there. It's also to pull the rug out from under you. I think the problem I have, <laughs> and I, and you know, I wonder why that guy didn't say I'm from Hawaii or Vancouver would have been a different <laughs> outcome. Anyway, yeah. I, the issue I have is I think <laughs> movies like Salvador by Oliver Stone or, the Killing Field, Roland Joffe, or even The Year of Living Dangerously, about these journalists in war torn. It's not. It's it's not about the politics. It's about their experience in the politics and them surviving. But they ask questions, and I think again, this where this movie for me personally fails. Unlike again, like um, Full Metal Jacket, it doesn't. I don't ask any questions in the end. Like you're saying, I don't care about it. I don't really care about their experience. I understand it. I, we can so easily deconstruct it. It's almost so too simple a movie that <laughs> I don't, I watch it and I go, okay, that's great. And I move on. It's doesn't, it doesn't need to feed me either. I think that's the wrong thing. We are such sheep where like Marvel movies, this is the good guys, this is the bad guys, right? It's not about that. Obviously, you don't know who's good and bad. That's his intention. But I just think he is so simple with this story. You're like, okay, they're they're grounded into this war. It happens to be our war, a conflict that we've seen a thousand times in a thousand different movies. But it's like, like you said, Walking Dead, you worry more about your neighbor, right? And they're hanging guys at the car wash than you do about what the government is doing. I also think of the movie, the postman. Right. So, but at the end of the day, you're like, eh, that's it. You're done. Yeah. Well, the, to the second half of Garland's uh, point there, it's, it's this idea of engagement um, to me. Yeah. I, I guess as I sit here and I say that word and I think about it, um, you know, a lot of the engagement I have with this movie come is coming after the movie. Um, you know, the, you know, it's one of those where, you know, is is was the movie so intentionally made so intentionally bad that that we're talking about it? Uh, you know, it almost seems like it was the right thing to do. You know, because I, I do. I mean, we 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 mentioned. I think we've all mentioned uh, this discussion we're having after it is uh, much more exciting than than the movie. And and maybe to me, maybe movies uh, movies have always been about how you, making you feel something. Uh, right. you, you being gripped in with the story. And this movie, for all intent and purpose, you know, it may not have done it right, but it, it accomplished that. Yeah. Right. Well, the only thing that's lacking is it didn't leave you with a desire to go back and watch it again. Right. And that's, that's one of the things. Like, it's like a one watch and then unlimited discussion, but nothing to get you back in to watch it again to further that discussion. It's basically like it's not spoon fed to you, but it's it's they're very complex characters, but it's such a simple 
simple, simple story that it's you can walk away with it with and lose very little in mem from memory <laughs> of what's happening yeah, yeah. and just talk about it uh, over and over again, which is kind of not the goal that you want with a movie because the whole goal of a movie is to tell such a great story that you want people to come back and get mm -hmm. reimmersed in that world and explore new aspects of that world um, again and again for further discussion. This one here presented it so effectively that I don't need to go back right. and, and watch again. Uh -huh. And because the character's depths were explored quite effectively as well in a very simplistic manner, I don't need to try and get back into the head of what Jesse was doing or what Sammy was uh, on his journey, what Lee's stuff was going on. It was very, it, it's, there's not enough subtext going on behind like, there. That was very surface. What you yeah, see is very surface, yeah. And that's it. And you know, it suffers from that. Alex Garland wants to be Kubrick. He said this, but he's not, he's a writer. That's and that's not all writers, but he's a writer that directs. It's like the Sorkin sort of thing. He's almost better when he, it's someone else directing his material. Yeah. Um, I would I would say maybe the caveat being, which I love, one of the greatest films is Judge Dredd. His Judge Dredd, and you know, there's controversy did he direct it or did someone else? But I feel like even you know, uh, you know, Twenty Eight Days Later, or you know, I think those you almost needed another hand to be less cerebral, be more emotional, have. Uh, you know, take it beyond the surface and, as you said, add a little subtext to it, whether it's visual subtext or something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, uh, let's see. I'm, uh, I, don't, I don't normally want to do it great, Alan. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, I'm, uh, I'm pulling something up here because uh, I remember uh, Chris and I saw uh, Civil War last Monday, just before we headed off to Vegas. And uh, I remember, you know, I remember, uh, sitting down before the movie starts and then uh everyone on the east coast had just see finished the movie and uh and i was looking and here's grace randolph um and she just kind of went off on the movie and one of the points here that uh that she brings up is uh, as one of the reasons she hates the movie is if you would shoot a defenseless unarmed person who is surrendering with their hands up in the air instead of arresting them then fuck you you're not a heroic person um, and then she goes on and says, a spoiler plot twist, it's the liberals doing the killing. Way to throw gas into the fire, super helpful. Um, and then she goes on, uh, the country needs to heal and see both sides kill, killing each other, even when people are trying to surrender, uh, killing prisoners of war. Uh, so very anti-war. Um, you know, is, is she right? No, when, when, we get, when you get embedded in war, you for, sometimes forget the reasons why you're fighting in the first place. It's about winning and survival. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This case here, I put it to you this way: the when you when you kill a martyr, or when you kill, sorry, when you kill a, the leader of an enemy, they turn out to become a martyr, and that ends up having far more repercussions after the fact. Where if you capture them, arrest them deconstruct their ideology to the world you kind of break out you break the idea because the idea is you cannot really fight with weapons you have to fight with essentially propaganda or, or counter propaganda in order to dismantle them so i i understand her point of view here but this was done to kind of shit uh show at least my interpretation of it was that because they shot that particular character and didn't arrest them and didn't hold a trial is that it was basically saying that this side is really no better than the other side. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that's oh, yeah. the point. All right, <laughs> yeah. here, let me, uh, we have a, well, we're quick here. Uh, okay. Robert Meyer Burnett, welcome to the uh, to verses. Uh I'm hungry now. Sorry, I'm late. I was just, uh, I, I, I just, I was, I uh, was helping. Elizabeth has her MFA, her final MFA show tomorrow. She's graduating from uh, college even after going back. So I was, I had to go and help her with something. So I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, Look yeah. at you with a college girl, big shot. <laughs> well, she's, yeah. you know, college girl in her fifth decade of life. That's what I thought. Continuing <laughs> education. But <laughs> yes, I was listening to this conversation. It's always, you know, I, I feel like lately the discourse on these channels has been going higher and higher and higher. And it's always a pleasure to be a part of that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, give me your impressions of Civil War and uh, maybe comment on anything we've, we've mentioned so far. Well, you know, to me, here's the thing. I think that there has been a disconnect because the movie was sold differently than the actual movie is. 
And it was sold as like this, I, I could say it like Red Dawn, you know, if the mm-hmm. 80s Red Dawn, the John Milius Red Dawn, Wolverines, you know, it was sold like that kind of a, a film, like it's Apocalypse Now, they're going up the Nung River looking for Kurtz, you know, or something. And the movie's not like that at all. And and I think that it, like like Scripty was saying, you know, the, the film is, we're now at a point, I think, in this country where ideologically we're, we're we're one step away from pitchforks and torches and people thrown in pits and burnt alive i mean there is so much animosity we've forgotten what it means that we all believe in the bill of rights that we all believe in the declaration of independence we all believe i mean we have taken american the the american the republic for so, taken it for granted for so long we've forgotten what we actually have and i think that that's part of what the message of civil war is. I mean, at the end of the day, you don't even know why you hate anybody anymore. You just know that you hate them. Mm-hmm. And and that is something that, that division is what people have counted on, despots have counted on uh, since time immemorial. It's, it's all you have to do is get one side to hate another side, and it doesn't even matter why they hate, just that they hate. You foment that animosity, and you can, you can, you can run through I mean, I've seen such anger on college campuses. I'm, I'm wondering where do you, where do you college students today think this is going to end? Because even the protests, if you go back to the '60s during the civil rights movement and during the Vietnam War protests, it felt like all of the students were of on the same side. I mean, I wasn't there, but that everybody was fighting for something that was just. They were, they were fighting for a cause outside of themselves. Now it seems like everybody's just, well, if you don't like what I like, then I'm going to, you know, take you out. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what, I mean, people have said, well, why are Texas and California allies in this movie? Yeah. And I think it's because they're both fighting against a fascistic dictator, you know, that in a way I see that that alliance be like, oh, California and, and uh, Texas would never get together. But I'm thinking, mm-hmm. you know what? If they both understand what their, our republic is all about, they might very well get together and fight something that is fascistic. And yeah. 20 years ago, Texas and California were politically aligned. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. That's the other yeah. thing you got to remember. California has not always been democratic. <laughs> <laughs> or, California. People think it's L.A., but they don't realize right outside of L.A. there it's as conservative. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was talking about that on my uh, – I did the video about that where you know the director goes into the reasons why Texas and California were aligned. Um, it's no different than the United States and the Soviets fighting against Germany back in World War II. They had a common enemy, and they just wanted to take that con- common enemy down. That's pretty much it, even though they were split – ideologically yeah. um but that's that's the whole thing it's like this movie again it gets people thinking about current day politics this is what grace randolph is upset about all the stuff that she's talking about in civil war we've seen that in other movies we've yeah. seen you know uh, you know political prisoners get shot and killed and everything and grace randolph is you know like oh my god oh my god and it's like we've seen this before why is she so pressed about it now she's pressed because of what's going on in the country today. So it makes it all contemporary, this particular movie, talking about our country, these states, you know, who's an American are you? What kind of an American are you? Like those kind of conversations are the kind of conversations that I think this movie wanted to bring out. And yeah, yeah it's a simple story. It's so simple. It's it's yeah. it's it's too simple, actually. But I think the, uh, yeah, let me just say, yeah. I think the most haunting thing about this film is You've seen all of this happen in movies in countries elsewhere, yeah. you know, yeah. across the seas, down, you know, on the other side sure. of the equator. Um, what's haunting about this is this is ha- he's depicting it's it. It's here. It's States. here. And it's contemporary. It's not set 50 years in the future. It's not set in the past. It's set literally right now. Yeah. You know, the, the in takedown the of the president era. is the same as the takedown of bin Laden, basically. Bingo, yeah. bingo. The, the the final shot, right? It's mm-hmm. that's exactly why I think people were little, you know, at least from Grace Randolph's point. And I'm not ripping on her, but I'm saying that's why she had the reaction she had is because and a lot of other people have had that reaction mm-hmm. is because it's now it's here. It's happening. And people are really worried and afraid about things like this jumping off all over the country. So it's like, well, why would you show this? Why would you promote this? Why would you? you know, have this type of a film come out. Like that's what's, that's what her, you know, angst was. 
But I think that it's a good conversation starter. I think this type of stuff needs to be out there just for people to kind of understand, hey, OK, these are the horrors of war. Are you sure this is the road you want to go down? You know, and then, you know, if two, you know, politically, ideologically different states can come together, then maybe there's a chance that we all can kind of figure these things out you know, some way or another, you know, at least again, that's what I think the director was trying to promote, whether that was successful or not. It's another story. Well, right now, today, we have something unprecedented in our country's history happening. And that is a former sitting president is in it, 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 picking oh, a jury trying. for a criminal yeah. trial for paying hush money to a porn star that he was having an affair with in order to prevent voters from knowing that he was doing this kind of thing for the 2016 election. And the question comes, you know, the question now comes down to what is it that we as Americans, what do we really believe? And I don't think that we're asked, we don't even ask ourselves that enough. We don't, we don't teach civics and civility, you know, in schools, our public education, our, our entire education system Everyone is teaching to the test. Everything comes down to money these days. And it used to be, you know, ideals and beliefs are not profitable in terms of how, what a company means. They're profitable in terms of our humanity. And uh, it, it's something that I think is being forgotten. Everybody with this whole, I want things to be the way I want. You better treat me. You better. I, it's my truth we're talking about. No, 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 no. There is the truth. And when you're setting up a country, there's not your truth and your truth and my truth. There is the truth that we're going to base our republic on. And in America, we're supposedly, we've all agreed to our, what our founding fathers set up, but even they are being discredited on a daily basis. And I always ask people, okay, what are you going to replace our system with? If we don't have American democracy and we don't have the republic that we have today, what do you want to have? Marxism? And if that's what you want, please point to me in the past when that has ever worked. Uh -huh. You know, and, and I think now it, it's it's I keep going back to the movie, The American President, you know, Michael Douglas. And it's like the prototype for for the West Wing. But there's a great speech at the end of that movie because. Aaron Sorkin wrote it. And you get it. I know a lot of people don't love, if you look at Josh Olson, Olson and listen to his podcast, they were not big fans of the West Wing. But I do love when Michael Douglas gets up and says, democracy is hard. You have to work for it. You have to want it bad. And I don't remember a time in my own life where I've grown up or lived in this country, I know Scripties in, in Canada, where we have taken our system of government and our, our daily lives for granted more than we do today, no, where people no. don't feel the need to participate. Yeah. Yeah, let, me, let me bring up this. Uh, news crisis, we're disconnected with each other. We just live in this other bubble. This, you know, it, it's part yeah. of that. The other, part let, too, let, let me just bring up this article here. A uh, pro Palestinian sure. activist hit with 16 felonies after going too far at a mm. city council meeting. She yeah. uh, she is given uh, threat. She has 16 felonies uh, charged against her for threatening to murder members of the Bakersfield, uh, California City Council. I mean, this is this is where we've come to. Um, it, because what Robert says you know, that would be unfathomable. You, right? Yeah, and look, Bakersfield okay. don't play that. Okay, play, exactly. Bakersfield here, don't play games like that. I mean, that that's. We yeah, they don't they don't mess around out there. So yeah, if That's you're gonna wonderful. make those kind of threats, you're out of your mind. Well, they're making those kind of threats because over the last 15 years or so, um, schools, private, public, charter have changed the way people debate. It is no longer about debating the the debating the the points. It's about just speaking the most words within the confined amount of time and trying to get yep. elicit an emotional reaction out of the audience. And that comes down to the fact that they have been decompiling essentially the education system to the point where. In the United States and in Canada right now, we actually are having our politicians violate our own constitutions mm -hmm. and not enough people are in any position to actually push back against it. It's now being relied on to the courts. And we're seeing some of the courts are compromised on both both of our countries and in other Western countries as well. So, yeah, there's lots of reason to be concerned here. And it's the, the sad part is, is that those that know a way to sort of um, bypass that bypass this and get back into the way things were run say over a generation ago 
are too small because so many of the population of, of the popular opinions are the talking points that don't actually get anything done. It, it's literally we're seeing the results of puppet masters manipulating vast people to do these things, to say these things without realizing what consequences will come as a result of that. That's why you have that that woman who believes what she believes and was so um so blinded by that belief to make those accusations and threats and is now facing a consequence for it. All right, and let me get, let me get maybe manipulated her is not going to get any problem, uh, not going to face anything. Yeah. Let me get remission here. I know we've been kind of talking over him. Sure. So did you, yeah. Oh no, I'm listening. This is great. I mean, I, it was what I think you said, uh, script doctor or, or Robert Meyer Burnett, that people don't, I mean, look how people drive, but people don't, aren't, there's like, we could all do, use some, uh, is it allocution, allocution sort of lessons, some politeness. It seems to have gone away. Uh, you know, I, I look at all films. I love films of World War II or whatever. And, you know, the way people speak, the way they're articulate, the way they treat each other, the way discourse happens is so different. And I just, like you said, everyone's rushed to get their opinion out. And if you don't agree with it, well, watch out. Well, you know, it's I, like Rob, I think you were saying this, Rob, with um, with America, it's like, who do, who are we and what do we believe in? And I think everybody's just kind of every man for himself instead of, you know, aligning under certain values. I think that America had the value of liberty and freedom. Like, that's how the country started. And yeah. now things are going further and further away from liberty. You know, we don't think about, you know, individual rights anymore. We think about, well, we got to. You know, we got to put everybody in a box, you know, and this is what we're going to do with you if you're this color or if you're this gender. And we're not looking at individual freedoms and liberties. That's what this country started with. And the further away we get from that, the further we move, in my opinion, towards something like a civil war, where now you have everybody putting themselves in categories and camps. And I don't talk to that camp over there, that camp, that's them. I don't talk to them, even though you might align on 90 percent of things in your life. You might have the same views and values for 90 percent of the things that you have. But on this one little 10 percent, we're going to go to war. We're going to fight each other. We're going to yell at each other, scream at each other and kill each other over like the tiniest things. So I think that's the main issue right now. If you're talking about just overall you know, the the values that we used to have in this country that have just completely disappeared. Um, they've disappeared because, you know, there are forces that, that are at work to divide people, to put people in camps, to separate you. You know, even though, again, you might agree, you know, overall with, you know, maybe maybe not 90 percent, but maybe like, you know, 60 percent, you know, and now we got to fight over these last little crumbs. It's like, yo, it, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, we mostly agree with this. And, and like Texas and California could come together in this movie. Maybe you guys can see the things that you are in agreement about. And let's figure out how to make everybody safe and happy in this world. And then we'll figure the other parts out. We'll go back to war after that and fight it out, you know, eloquently, uh, as uh, Ayer was saying. Well, Elizabeth Young in the chat uh, said empathy, you know, and, and yeah. I'll tell you something. Uh, this is why I, I will always have hope and be optimistic. It's just a, a personal experience relative in my neighborhood. Uh, I live about an hour outside of Los Angeles and my, uh, one of my tires blew out and my car doesn't have a spare. It's an electric uh, hybrid that doesn't have a spare. So I'm sitting by the side of the road and I called, you know, a roadside assistance and they'll, the getting a tow while I was sitting on the side of the road, I must've had five different people, uh, that, that ran the gamut in terms of the, the rainbow, shape, sizes, colors, creeds. Five people stopped and asked if I needed help. Can I drive you somewhere? Anything? And these are just people randomly. It was it was nighttime. It was like 8.30 at night. Um, they didn't have to stop, but they stopped. Right. They just stopped yeah. and they said, hey, do you need help? And I still believe that most of Americans are that way. Like if you're outside and your neighbor sees you, like if you're building a fence or you're doing something, you're hauling something, invariably somebody in your neighborhood is going to be like, hey, man, you need some help? And and I honestly believe, and these kinds of things transcend barriers of, of race, of sexuality, of class, of religion. I do think that one of the great things about America is that we do have empathy. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of what Americans are are angry about is how people are treated overseas. I mean, it's interesting now. Every now our focus is on Gaza. I was just hearing, but as I'm, I was driving here, about what's happening in Sudan. Eight million people displaced. 
you know, I, I, we don't even talk about that here because everybody wants to jump on their their. I, I didn't hear what anybody protest the Syrian what happened in Syria or what happened in Yemen or what happened in Libya. You know, everybody wants to jump on their buzzword talking points, and people are not taking the time to learn and understand a situation. We don't even know history in this country anymore. Yeah. People have a cursory knowledge. They only know what's in front of them, what they've been told. And by the way, social media has been used by bad actors to divide us. You can't destroy the United States uh, militarily, but we're certainly doing a great job destroying our generations of younger people that are going to grow up with no way of dealing with each other or themselves. And that's the way, if you read Bekmenetov or whatever, the, the Russian who defected to Canada in the 80s, he laid out the Russian strategy of destroying a generation and how long it takes. That's been going on since we were given these devices that we're carrying around for the last 15 years. I mean, you start in 2012, 2013, and we've seen the erosion of, of basic... When you don't know what your country stands for, how are you supposed to stand for what your country right. stands for? Why and can just love thy neighbor? Hundred percent. And the I mean, go back too. to the Bible before you know, before casting, before throwing the first stone, or those who live in glass he, houses he was without sin. sin. Yeah, he, he, he was. He was with us. Yeah. Stone. But the other part too is we also have developed a culture where we literally put all our eggs in one basket. We only look to one person or one entity to solve our problems, as opposed to diversifying that and proper diversifying that, which is a collection of different ideas to come forward. Right now, the United States has only two presidential candidates that people are talking about out of what, 300 potential that could have actually probably been more appealing to the rest of the world. And one of them is the middle of a criminal court case. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing a is couple, like when you, yeah. you the, we uh, in, in the West have actually limited our own choices through simplicity as opposed to exploring the and understanding the people that want to represent us or stepping forward to be that representative. We're like Dune. We love to deify. Yeah. And we love to tear down. I mean, heck, the 60s, the Kennedy dynasty, like that's still prominent today. I mean, I mean, I remember reading in history Joe Kennedy Sr. and all the controversy that he did during uh, before entering before the United States entered the war. And yet, you know, his son becomes president and people loved him, but were also very divisive with some of his mistakes. Then you've got Ted Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. And now Robert Kennedy Jr. is running for, for office as an independent. That is a dynasty that a lot of people are loyal to loyal to. But the other part doing is like, is he really just the only other candidate there's no one else there that is also going to throw their hat in the ring that's able to do like brand names yeah exactly you like the familiarity and the easy as opposed to well guess what society is not easy and it's not supposed to be easy it's supposed to be a, a means of working together and getting through our differences but also building up the things that we we both value or that we all value and you can't do that when you limit the choices for those that represent you in such a small small pool and listen the parliamentary system that i'm a part of isn't perfect either but there's definitely a lot more variety going on there than there is in a two-party system, even though within that two-party system, they're broken up to subclasses. There's libertarian and then there's democratic socialism and there's all those other things, to, but they're all under those bigger tents. And that's what makes things, I think, a little muddy for, for the voting public. And also the, the same thing that's going on here. The ending of civil war, to bring it back to that, is literally they have put all their eggs in one basket with regards to this one character, the president. And they think if they get rid of him, their problems are solved. And the truth of the matter, every single time is it's never them. It's about the people that lifted them up. And if they're still around and they're not held account to account, it's going to go right. on perpetually. Off the head of the snake, another head grows. In it. Yeah, let me. Yeah. So let me just say uh, thank you to the over 1,100 people watching us right now. Uh, you could do us a big favor and support us by just hitting that like button. Uh, subscribing, uh, hit uh, follow on on uh, Rumble and thumbs up, all that all that good stuff. Um, I'll just say uh, where where Chris is. Um, there's going to be a big announcement on Wednesday, and I, by big I mean an AEW level <laughs> announcement. And if you know anything about AEW, you know how big that announcement's going to be. By the way, I, I just want to say something. This happened today in this country. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court announced today that it will not hear McKesson versus Doe. The decision not to hear McKesson leaves in place a lower court decision that effectively eliminated the right to organize a mass protest in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. Under a lower court decision, 
a protest organizer faces potentially ruinous financial consequences if a single attendee at a mass protest commits an illegal act. It is possible that this outcome will be temporary, but think about that. In three states, if you want to organize a political protest or any kind of a protest, and one person does something wrong at that protest, the people that organize that protest are now financially responsible. Wow. So Maybe Civil War, the, the movie doesn't res resonate with us because it is what it is what we're sort of living in now, right? In well, the, yeah, let me bring that as kind of uh, my final point here today, and and we'll get to everyone's super chats. We'll read everyone uh, all your comments. Uh, but the the question I have is: Is the movie Civil War is it prophetic or is it merely a mirror? Skewed mirror at best. Hmm. Yeah, I would say it's a mirror more than a, than, well, than 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 the inevitable. <laughs> yeah, I don't I think it's inevitable. In America, I don't think that it won't get to that point. I think. Yeah, I think just from this movie coming out, people are going to think twice. But I, I don't think that we're that. I, I I hate. I would hate to say that. Yeah, we are that divided in this country where now we are definitely you know without any breaks heading towards a civil war i i don't think we're that far i i don't think i don't think we've gone that far um i don't you know either. again maybe maybe i maybe that's me hoping more than believing but I, I i don't think we've gone that far i, I it's like rob said there's so many people out there that you know you come across on a daily basis you know i've been from you know one side of the country to the other in the last year and i've met people everywhere and you know everybody's good. Everybody's cool. Yeah. Are there pockets of people where there's some, you know, some kerfuffle, some, some negative comments, some, you know, down talking. Sure. And, it, and a lot of it is online. A lot of it is on social media, but you know, I don't think we're, I don't think we are that far down. I don't, I, I think this film again, is just kind of a warning. It's just like, Hey, it could get to this point if you want it to get to this point. You know, if you don't, stop what you're doing right now and you start focusing on, you know, hey, let's just start respecting each other and, you know, accepting everybody's differences. You know, that's kind of what this country really started with. Again, just individual liberty. That's what I'm saying. Congress you're different. Respect anybody. They don't respect each other. If well, but from a, don't respect each other, how do they expect it to trickle down? I'm right. Right. And I think that's the problem is that a lot of people, you know, again, a lot of this stuff, in my opinion, is is literally online. A lot of it is on social media. A lot of it is not in real life. When you get outside right. and start talking to people in real life, you're not dealing with this. You know, I don't deal with this when I go to the grocery store. I don't deal with this when I'm walking down the street, just meeting random people saying hello on my job, on a vacation. I, I'm just not running into this type of, you know, hate and vitriol. It's just not happening like that. So is it possible? Yeah, that there are pockets of people that will stir up some trouble. Yes. Is it possible that there's a, a a few people in a certain state that might try to secede from the union and say, "Hey, we're going to secede. We're going to we're out of here." You know. Yes. Could that lead to a civil war? Sure. Well, do I think it's going to happen? Probably not. You know. I just also, don't. I, don't th I just don't think we're that far down that line. Is but a big declaration, or is it a death by a thousand cuts? Is it that you? When do you know when you're in it or when you're out of it? Right. Yeah, it's what I was just Definitely. thinking about the uh, first episode of the first season of Twilight Zone, where an entire town went at each other's throats because a bunch of aliens were flickering lights. Right. The exactly. monsters are due on Maple Street. Yeah. 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 Great. yeah. But I, I do think, you know, like what D.A. was saying, I, I do think that when you're dealing with somebody face to face, we have a lot of I mean, you know, a keyboard warriors is such a it, it doesn't really do the do it justice. Mm -hmm. The problem that I think a lot of us have is especially we are woefully unable to we're not going out and meeting people the way that we used to. Mm -hmm. We're not interacting. I mean, I'll give you a, an example. When I was a kid, when you turned 16, you got a driver's license like immediately. Everybody wanted a driver's license. A driver's license meant liberation from your parents. You could get it. You could go out and get a job. Nowadays, kids aren't getting driver's license. And the thing about driving is when you're driving, there's all this stuff you learn that you didn't even know you were learning. Like one, how to how to navigate a highway, you know. But also when you go to a gas station, you learn things like etiquette when you get to the pump if the gas station's full. Going in and talking to people behind the counter and talking to other people, you you have to practice civility. 
the whole act of driving and be a part of that ecosystem is you have to learn how to anticipate what other people are doing. It's teaching you a whole way of thinking about the community around you just by being behind the wheel of a car. We now have a whole group of young people that aren't getting a driver's license. So that that part of that developmental process about being a teenager, being an adolescent and, and, and having that rite of passage, that's not happening. And there are so many other areas of life that I had, because I'm old, growing up that are absent from today. And those yeah. things, like we are free range kids and we we're like, you know, eight years old, we were running around outside all day long, come back when the yeah, the lights come on and come out. Yep. And you had Pretty to learn fun. how to parlay with with other friends of yours. Like, well, what do you want to do? We'd have to make a decision. You don't want to sit around and yell. And you would learn how to listen to one another and then make a course of action. Go do something. <laughs> and I think that's something that we've lost the ability to do. Certainly, politically, you can't even, on college campuses, kids can't even hear somebody that's going to say something that might make them feel bad. They can't. They want to cancel. They want to get rid of that speaker. Rather than listen to what that speaker has to say and look, listen, well, that's a garbage take. Let me figure out a way to refute what that person's saying in, in such a way that I understand and I can I understand where they're coming from now. Let me formulate a contrary opinion to combat what I think is a wrong way of thinking. Nowadays, I don't want to hear that. Let's just get rid of that person. And it's crazy yeah. to me. They immediately other. They, that's the he's the other. They other that guy and say he's out. Mm -hmm. You know, Ixnay, don't listen to him. Don't talk to him. He's an other. You know, and whatever that happens to be, it doesn't matter what what it is. He's yeah. other. And, he's not yeah. us. And they'll find and that so one when you, or, or that one uh, question, right. questionable judgment that they made long ago in their life, or even a couple hours ago, and that and that will stick with them. That's the scarlet letter they will carry with them. Kids uh, don't even understand that. I mean, when I was. When I, when I was going to college and when I first got out of college and went into the entertainment business, I knew that I didn't know anything. And I knew that I was going to get coffee for people for three years. And I knew that I was going to sit down, shut up, and do what was asked of me and learn something I didn't know anything about. Nowadays, yeah. everybody thinks they already know everything and there's nothing to learn. Why would you go to college and yell at your college professors? Like you worked all this time, you you filled out applications, you did all this work to get into the school that you're at, and now you're making demands of that school. Maybe the quite maybe it's different. Maybe the way we learn is different. I'm just being, you know, I'm being. Uh, I just want to look at the other side. I think our discussions will change once AI supercomputing. We will not be fighting each other. There will be something else over that that's coming for us. Maybe, perhaps. But I still yeah. think learning how to think. Regardless it if it's AI or an alternate point of view or a friend or a foe or whatever, learning how to think and how to deal with situations is always important. Well, well so that's the problem is pointed out to you, that's really important, Robert, and that is the, the students in college were going to the college and they are making accusations at their professors. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like customers upset with the service that they're getting at a retail store. They are complaining mm -hmm. to management. And because you know what? They charge way too much for it. Well, not only they do charge way too much, but that's the only <laughs> valid reason of complaint. The problem is that when you go to university, you are not necessarily a customer. You are a student there to learn. But the, the universities now are thinking of them as customers because they have to be happy. Otherwise, people won't go to their school and pay them. Right. Money. It's all exactly. about the money. That's how we got to this situation is because right. they didn't push back and said, no, we you are here out of a privilege, not just for being able to pay for it, but we also had the threshold of you need grades to be able to afford our services. Right. And that's they, the they deal that we made. That. This is I not like going into a Walmart, so being upset that a toothbrush you want is five dollars more expensive than the one across the street at, you know, Walgreens and going and trying to get a price match and yelling at the management if they don't give you a discount on top of that. The bigger problem is that everyone getting. assumes they should go to college and have a four year degree or whatever. Everyone stopped learning skills. Right. They stop I, learning yeah. something to exchange the, the theory of exchange. I make this and I exchange it for that, whether it be a skill or an item or it's, no one does that anymore. They fe feel, oh, I go to this college. I'm paying for it. I deserve to get hired. I deserve this. Right. It's a bit of an entitlement, but it's also what's been fed. I don't want them. And I it's the experience it. of like the experience of college was at some point in time, once upon a time was to gain the necessary knowledge that you needed in order to go forward and do some certain job okay. um, and we, and the skills and everything. And now it's like the knowledge and this, everything is at your fingertips. 
people just don't want to do that level of work. I mean, you know, you got a phone that's, right here. That's you can look the up real problem. You want to look up mm -hmm. on a phone in five seconds flat. So the knowledge isn't the issue any longer. So we don't have a knowledge problem where people don't have access to knowledge. Like the entire world has access. Well, maybe not the entire world, but, you know, most Americans have access to the Internet to be able to look up, you know, different talking points. OK, this guy says this. I just like every time I see someone come out with some kind of crazy article or something that's saying X side did this and that. I the first thing I do is look it up. I don't go off the headline. I look it up. I research it. I read through it. I try to figure out okay what actually happened. And I and I don't just stop with one article. I go to two or three or four articles, and then I might do some research on the back end to see how did this all start. Nobody's doing that, and that's how you get into ideological camps because you're not interested in the truth. You're interested in what makes you feel good, what makes you feel a certain way. Oh, I want to be angry at something, so I'm going to be angry at these guys over here. And it's like okay, and I found a headline that. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. This this locks right in with what I feel right now. Everybody's working off of emotionalism and nobody's actually digging down and saying, all right, what is what is this situation really about? It doesn't matter what the situation is. What is it about? Why did this guy say this or why did this president or why did this you know congressman say this? Why did they do this? Let me dig deep. Let me research. Let me hear his argument. You know, let me listen to the other side's argument instead of just following the ideological slant that a lot of people on social media and, and even members of our government want us to follow. Listen, this this is the part the part of the problem is that freedom requires you to be responsible and people don't want to be responsible. They want the freedom, but they don't want the responsibility of the freedom. You have to be responsible for your vote. You have to be responsible for your actions every single day. So that's the biggest problem that I see with young men and women in schools. It's like, hey, I don't want the hard work of looking up and doing the research and actually, you know, hearing both sides and then coming up to my own conclusions. If you do all of that, you can come up to any conclusion you want to come up to. Brush. I feel like we're like old guys talking about this young generation. They don't, this, they don't work. I well, we are. We, right. hey, we had freedom. Yeah. I sat in for a friend. I sat in. But that's what we used to do. We, I, I, I went to, I went to Berkeley. I mean, that's like the most liberal school in the world. But we were still challenged to look things right. up to actually like, OK, this is what this guy says. Listen to this other guy. Don't just fall in line with what I believe. Look it up and challenge me. Like that's where, in my opinion, you can go in back and challenge your professor, but only if you've done the work. And a lot of these, you know, again, it's just maybe the nature of the beast right now in our culture. Nobody wants to do the work, even though the work has never been easier to do. It's so easy to just to jump on your phone and just start looking stuff up, at least be knowledgeable. You know, instead of just ideological, you know, at least know what you're talking about and then have the wisdom to apply that knowledge, you know, appropriately, depending on your life. Maybe they're trying to engage young people in a classic way that doesn't work for them. Maybe it doesn't speak to them in a way that spoke to us. I'm just saying I sat into I sat in this cinematography class at UCLA and the and I was just sitting in for a friend. And it was interesting because the professor spent most of the time, almost every class, and I asked him later if he did this the whole class, he spent most of the class teaching using YouTube videos because mm. one, he thought that would help engage them. But a lot of them were like, I could learn this on most yeah. young people. I, watch those videos on at home. I can, yeah. the thing is I could not learn stuff before because I didn't have a director's commentary on a DVD or, or the storyboards would show me for, for what I do or a, a class that had all these YouTube videos. I don't need that anymore. I could learn it all on my own. The next Kubrick can make their own film and learn everything they have to learn yes. from the internet. If they have the gumption, you know, 10 people, 10 people go to film school. One's always going to succeed. The other nine are going to fail. That is just the odds of life in general. So you always figure out if 99% aren't getting hired or whatever, how are you the 1% that is, right? right. That's for everything, regardless of generation. Sure. I just think it's engagement. We have to figure out how do we add value? How do we engage people? And I just don't think it's working. And we could talk about ideology, all this other stuff, but I think it's just human nature in the end. All right, let's uh let's get to your comments. Uh, here's your chance to chime in, uh, and we'll just go down here. Uh, James Woolard and Joy Joy Khan, uh, your brand new members, uh, as Lord Thoth always likes to say, uh, like, share, subscribe, hit that uh, bell no for notification. Sign up as a member and join us on Discord. I will be on there. I've been to Vegas. I haven't been able to be on there for a bit. Uh, Eric Stratton for seven. 
77, thank you. Uh, nice job on the, the Film Threat Meetup last Tuesday. From what I saw, I think you solidify connections with many who attend. Alan, my dad called me number one son. Oh, <laughs> good for you. My, my dad didn't call me that. Uh, <laughs> Red French Moon for uh, two euros. Uh, Ing Ku successful. Alan Reach, Film Threat CEO. Yes. And again, <laughs> uh, Wednesday, uh, I'll we'll have a note from Chris. Um, it'll be uh, AEW important. Uh, okay. Thomas Pickett. Uh, the journalists are very ideal of what a journalist should be. The journalists are uh, very ideal of what the journalists should be. He's <laughs> talking about the movie, right? Yeah. 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 This is a great point that the journalists are so idealistic, but I think he does a good job of showing how they're not, how they're stepping over Lee, who just died. Even Joel doesn't check on Lee. She's right. Dead, and they're still getting the shot. Joel is, I want to ask the president a question. It's, But I think Thomas brings up a really good point that it's not so idealistic. Who the, you know, and as we know, media is can bend in different ways too. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, and I like the fact that the best protection is a press badge uh, in the middle of the war. <laughs> so, and uh, press apparently don't, don't have any it. protection on your back. In, in I know. Stuff. All you need is that press uh, press jacket, and you're safe. Uh, big black dog, uh, we're in a civil war, says Tim Pool. Uh I think that's an oversimplification. I mean, our civil war costs ten cost us tens of thousands of American lives on both sides, and uh, we're not there yet. We're not there yeah. yet. I think he said the words "cold civil war" at least the, one of the times I heard him speaking, saying it's a cold war, but it's like a cold civil war. So it's I can maybe agree part. with that part. That's a great you know? word. I like that. I didn't hear that. I like that. Yeah. Cold civil okay. War. Uh, Byron B, uh, the choice to make the conflict vague was very interesting. Only at the end uh, is it uh, WF versus White House security. Uh, yeah, so I forget what WF was. Is that the Western? Western, 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 Western yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, for uh, $10, thank you, from Darth Racer 777 I saw Civil War on a free, free streaming service. Glad I did. I didn't spend any money. It was boring. The actors appeared bored. Uh, even the action sequences at the end didn't pull it uh, up for me. It's a two out of ten. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, from T Rex, for two dollars. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Obama did kill U.S. citizens, uh, allegedly. All right. Uh, Naru Tak. Uh, for 999 I think a lot of people are making the mistake of reviewing the movie they expected to see or wanted to see instead of the movie that they actually got much like the Phantom Menace back in 1999 uh, I think that's a definitely valid point uh, trailers um, I've been having this discussion all the time uh, especially at CinemaCon but trailers seem to uh, I don't know it, filmmakers don't get involved in trailers and sometimes the message uh, comes out wrong. I, I remember the original Civil War trailers thinking, oh my God, this is going to be one of those movies where, uh, you know, it's MAGA against everyone else. And it's just going to be, this movie is going to be on the nose. And the uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and it was, it was, I think that led, honestly, that led to me liking it more just by the fact that it wasn't a movie that I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I was wondering, like, if you were to cut a trailer from this film based on what you know, what trailer is going to get the most butts in seats? Yeah. You know, from a, you know, I think this trailer probably did the best job of, you know, if you think of everything that's in this film and, okay, what are we going to show? A bunch of journalists traveling around? Nobody's coming to watch that, you know, but if you start showing something that looks like it's going to be a war movie all the way through. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going right. to check that out. I agree with yeah. you. But we, we well, do yeah, have to give it up. Are, it worked. It worked. I mean, A24 yeah. had their biggest opening. And I would yep. say this. The fact that we're having this kind of a conversation about this movie proves that it's successful in, in whatever way you want to call it a success. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think obviously I like seeing movies that are thought provoking. I, this movie has made me think about it for a long time. We're having this conversation now. And I would like to see more cinema that has this that, that has more on its mind. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that the, this this is, if there's anything, I, I mean, we're we're actually we're living through a pretty great uh, period of time in terms of entertainment history. Say say what you want about you can be cynical about 
IPs and the MCU and the DCEU or whatever. But between something like this, between between Shogun, between Three Body Problem, Dude. between uh, there's so many interesting things happening that are thought provoking mm -hmm. and stay with you. Uh, I think it's it's a pretty great time to uh, to be enjoying entertainment. I agree. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jimmy V, uh, either explain your world building or make your characters people you want to watch in this vague world. And the movie does neither. It's very surface. I agree. I think what he's saying, it's very, it works on a surface level. It doesn't, it, unlike, uh, unlike a full metal jacket, it doesn't ask enough questions for me. Yeah. It just presents. Do you, do you feel like the main characters, uh, as journalists, do you, do you feel like, that um, do you feel like uh, the idea of journalists has changed over time, and and is was this group of journalists representative of what you feel journalism is today? Overall, of journalism today, no. But yeah. of journalists that I know that try to report on the facts and not editorialize, yes. But those are few and far between these days. I mean, heck, even if, like someone quoted Tim Pool. Tim Pool editorializes only, like he mm -hmm. doesn't report on anything. He just editorializes other people's reports uh, and he does it very well. He's got a huge audience for that, but where are the actual journalists that are just reporting on the facts without editorializing They're they're I don't see them in any of the big um, legacy media mm -hmm. areas. I see maybe, maybe it's why they photographers in this movie. Yeah. I found that interesting because these are photographers, meaning they take except their for pictures. Joel. Uh, Joel was the actual reporter, but the other, uh, and um, Sammy was well, the reporter, but the two women were the photographers. Right. My point though, is, is that, mm -hmm. you know, they're taking pictures, which will eventually be uploaded somewhere versus someone who's live on the ground, you know, sensationalizing the action around them. Yeah. You know, they're reporting after the fact while, you know, while we like the journalists who report live. Right. Oh yeah. Like, well, they yeah, had the one journalist. Girl, Didn't they have like the the friends that were at the very end? They were. Yeah, I like that. I like I like that they were just like all they can do is take pictures. That's it. They take pictures, and then it's up to you to figure out what that picture means or what that picture is supposed to convey. I like that aspect of the of their job. And then you don't really get to you know. Okay, well, let's talk about this. Let's have this conversation. I'm going to write this in my story. None of that's a part of these. This four core journalists that we're following it's just we're taking the pictures you know let's get the best pictures we can get let's get up close let's get personal um i like that I, I thought that that was perfect and i mean you know if journalists were really like that i think things would be a whole lot different in today's world An another problem too with journalism i mean you saw this in michael mann's film the insider a little bit how like cbs news always funded its news organization even though it was always at a tool it, it lost money that that it, their news their news division was not supposed to be profitable because uh, impartial reporting was sacrosanct to them and now we don't have journalists that are part of organizations that are willing to subsidize gut, gutsy journalism everything has to be done for a profit you know we got 24 hour news cycles and everybody's got to be making money and keeping those eyeballs down. and where where i think the real question that civil war asks is what is the state of journalism and how important are journalists how important is impartiality how important is reporting and you know i've always loved we've seen some great movies about journalism spotlight there's a there's a, a movie on i think it's on netflix called scoop that jillian anderson. jillian anderson's in you know and um i've all all yeah all the president's men i mean there's so many the paper even ron howard's the paper there's a lot of of and journalism is something that we're real great hard-hitting journalism is something we are severely lacking and we need there's a reason why a democracy our our republic has freedom of the press there's a reason why it's so important and i think that this movie brings up those questions of course they're, they're not sexy to a movie going audience today but they're necessary we have freedom of the press but no one reads right that's right i'll be honest i i, I hate watching the news because i feel like i'm being gaslit constantly <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right uh this is a good one um from superhero movies uh, are finished and it's over Let's talk about uh cynical uh the the sound design was so good powerful impact from the speakers behind the screen the sides of the auditorium and the rear of the auditorium. Let me ask you this. Maybe it was my screening, but but is it me or did the opening moments of this movie feel like it was a sound test for your theater? 
That's yeah. A, that's oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. This was one of the best design movies in terms of sound. I agree with them. I meant to say that earlier. This yeah. is it's great sound design. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, it's it's almost too good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from Rumble, AD Ellis, uh, Garland took a pretty bold position with men, and then backfired on him. Uh, this feels like a direct response to that. So, men would actually be the only movie without Nick Offerman in it because there was only one, <laughs> one guy. Right. You, you know, Alex Garland yeah. always finishes up his third acts. He always, for me, he always fails. And yeah. the script doctor, you may be able to speak better to this, but he always. So he always kind of fails in his third acts. Yeah, men, I, yeah. for men that was definitely the case for me. That that third act was like uh, I'm done. Men, I don't remember too much of, but I will say the most egregious failure I noticed was in his show Devs, which ended up being Deus. Yes. That was horrible. Um, I I think that goes back to what I said earlier: is he he comes up, he develops very interesting concepts, but he doesn't do all the work to make sure they're authentically done because I think he's more more focused on getting the idea out on the page than and then just going from there as opposed to getting it on the page looking at it and then saying okay i've got to rewrite this to make this the most authentically told story of this idea as possible i don't think he takes that patience in there it works to his benefit because it gets people interested in the idea but the execution always feels like it just falls short every time even with um ex machina i felt there was something off even or, annihilation i felt like that oh annihilation especially yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although that well, was based on someone else's book, it was. But, yeah. mm -hmm. but I want to say that Debs, off, he changed the ending. Debs, Debs though, the, the, oh, oh, the seventh episode of Debs blew my mind, and then the eighth episode, I was like, "Wait, what?" Right? <laughs> yes, I was I, so I was. let down by the because I was it led up. I was so with it, and then when you get to episode seven, it to me it was so mind blowing. I couldn't wait to see where he was going to end this whole thing, and then it was like, "Oh, he didn't have an ending." Right. Yeah. To give Grace Randolph her due, she she talks about it. he doesn't understand politics, warfare, or journalism. Of course, Grace Randolph is one of the great political thinkers of our time. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to a woman at her age that doesn't know how to apply makeup. I'm just throwing that out there. That's, yeah, that's okay. your point. So, Freddy Vo says, uh, "Sounds like old school '70s '80s where you're where you followed characters and then the movie ends with no real resolution, nor point. There was an event." And the world moves on from it, which is frustrating, uh, but interesting. I, I will say that's how I felt with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. No. Uh, oh. so, yes, I said it. I, said it. You know, I was going to say The Candidate with Robert Redford, which oh. is great. It's a great movie, but you kind of dive into the middle of it, and you kind of dive out the middle. And it's about the character changing in the moment. It's not about that yeah. narrative. But he, but he stuck it with the landing in, in The Candidate. That's yeah, he did. But yeah. I'm just saying, it's like the 70s movies. You're right. Is that Michael Ritchie? Michael Ritchie? Michael director? Ritchie, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, from Byron B. again. Uh, I haven't heard any reviewers talk about how Blacks the subject of the first civil war are portrayed in this movie. Uh, tire burn man. I, I'm afraid I'm going to say something uh, racist here, but I'll read on a uh, pinned militia uh, press old man, uh, white house secretary, a Western front female sergeant, you know, uh, Jess in her mind, right. Or Lee, sorry. In her mind, she takes that picture of the man in the tire and he's burning. He's on fire. Mm -hmm. It's showing. Oh, that. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's right. Taking the picture, right? She didn't care, you know, and and the press old man is Sammy, right? And the white right. house so, says, hey, so, you negotiate. Yeah, sure, we'll negotiate. Bang, bang, bang. Well, so I mean to the question then, what were were these just good actors who for that role, or was there an intention behind making these characters black? I hmm. saw nothing in it myself. I don't I think didn't... there's any purpose. I mean, they're just actors. Playing, right. you know, just I, acting. I yeah, I don't think there was anything to be derived from the fact that you know the black, you know, from the Civil War, obviously with slavery. I don't think that had anything to do with it. I don't think there was any, um, anything I could pull out of that. Plus, it's Garland's really a Brit, I guess, and uh, and and the British. There's a there's a different experience. Yeah. You know, they don't have the same. The 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 relationship is different than we have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, super chat, uh, Oliver Lavery Farouk Farug, uh, for s five pounds. Uh, thank you. It falls a little flat to me. I feel like it learned too hard in it leaned too hard into the interpretation aspect, uh, creating many generic parts. I don't think you need to. Hmm. 
All right. And then the, oh, I don't think you need to take sides, but having characters with personal experiences from either side could have uh, had the audience empathize with someone they disagree with. Right. Remember Full Metal Jacket where they find that uh, sniper and they go in there and it's that woman. Oh, yeah. Kill me. It doesn't matter what side you're on. It's the most horrific war we've ever had. And, you know, it had an emotional response regardless of how you felt and you cared about those characters. Right. And this I agree. This one didn't. It just was really flat. Yeah. There there was almost a a fairy tale aspect to the movie, Um, kind of an Mm -hmm. otherworldly feel to it. Uh, that that you know kept you from making kept you from making that link to this being some kind of authentic event that occur, could occur in the future. Um, all right, from JJKK, member for one month. Uh, I can picture the smug look on Garland's face anytime someone asks the question about his movie. Oh, was that your assumption? Uh, that says a lot about you. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this: uh, Does does your feeling about this is this a, a personality test? Uh, Does your feeling about this movie uh, or other people's feelings about this movie uh, say a lot as to who you are in your politics and your personality? What if I don't care? Well, then that says a lot about your personality. That says a lot about you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Go ahead, Rob. You you start. No, I I, I mean, I, I don't. Look, I think people go to see movies first and foremost to be entertained. You know, and 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 it comes down to what do people find as being entertaining? And a lot of people, if I went and saw this movie uh, based on the trailer alone, I would have expected it to be a different kind of film, not a not a meditation on journalists or I wanted to see two conflicting Americas battling one another, you know, give me the action seek, give me the Olympus has fallen version of this terrorists on the mall and helicopters, you know, but that's not what I got. And I think that a lot of people wanted, might have thought this was a bait and switch a little bit. So I can understand that. But I do think, I do think that that when you walk out of a movie, it's always important to ask yourself, "Huh, okay, I was expecting something. I didn't get maybe what I was expecting, but obviously the filmmaker was trying to say something to me. I always try and ask myself, well, what was the filmmaker trying to say?" Right. Because even if I'm I'm perplexed or something by a film, and, and and we to be fair, we don't get that very much anymore. Like I grew up with, I always talk about uh Antonioni's Ennui trilogy from the early 60s, La Note, La Ventura, and the Eclipse. I've maintained, I talk about this a lot of my own YouTube show, that we we're not even most people can't even get through those movies. We don't even know how to watch a movie like that anymore. Right. And and we just don't. We don't have the ability to sit down and or a movie I dearly love last year at Marion Bad. I've told mm. people to watch it like what the f was that about? Why'd you tell me to watch that movie? They get so <laughs> angry about it and I'm like, well, because cinema has become very homogenized or it's become people only think of movies as being one thing these days where they used right. to be many different things. And I think with this movie, I think Alex Garland is worthy of our respect whether you love his stuff or not, whether he can stick the landing or not, you have to ask yourself, what was he trying to do in telling this story? And whether you like the movie or not, uh, most people just, if they don't like it, they dismiss it. But I always at least try and ask myself, well, okay, I, I didn't like this, but why didn't I like it? And what was this filmmaker? Why did he spend two years of his life making it? Yeah. I think the question is, what is the response or what is it that they said? You know, I think a lot of people brought ideas and feelings into this film before they actually watch the film based on you know what's currently going on obviously in the country yep. and you know i think a lot of people just brought that in with them and so their response to this film based on what they brought in whether it be how they feel about journalism or how they feel about you know texas and california teaming up or whatever the case is how do they feel about those particular subjects and their response to that is what says something about them. That's what says something about you. If you hate journalists and then you walk in and you see a movie that really doesn't give you much about the journalists, it just kind of says, well, these guys are just here to kind of cover this war and they're going from place to place to place taking pictures. And that's really it. You know, you don't really get a lot about their feelings, their ideas, you know, what side of the war they fall on. You don't get any of that, you know, as much as you might expect. And so 
you might say, well, they're trying to make journalists look good. And it's like, well, maybe they're just giving you journalists. They're just giving you what journalism should be. You know, so I think that's to the point that uh, JJKK is saying is that, you know, if you bring something into this film with you, if you bring in your own personal expectations about the current climate of the world and then you walk out feeling one way or another about the film, whether you liked it or disliked it, it does say something about your personal opinions because you brought that in to the film. Uh, I must be of an inner serial killer because I thought the movie was so tame. And I think 10 <laughs> years from now, it'll get even tamer. Yeah. Oh, I understand. Yeah, I was wondering, like, how that. do you guys think this film would play in a different era? Like if we went back like 30 years, you know, same film. <laughs> Before, uh, you know, before these, before Walking Dead. Like what I'm saying is it's like outside of the current stuff, right. outside of what's currently going on. If this film came out in like a completely different era, a completely different time, in this exact same film, I think it's, I think it's a meaningless film at that point. I think I, this I think film only better. resonates because of what's going on right now. And if no, it doesn't, if what's going on right now isn't happening right now, I think you can bring this film out and people will just be like, what is this? It could no, no, resonate I, 30 years from now. It could resonate on what's happening across the pond to say, look, what you see on the TV news, nightly news, let's say in the 70s or 80s, that could be us. Just okay. as you know. Yeah, I think it would resonate better because we are actually in a generation right now where audiences want made to order movies. They don't want to be challenged too much. They right. want they want it advertised directly. Uh, a, yeah. The generation preceding us, they were just like, oh, this is a movie. This is kind of the premise. Okay, let's see what it's got. This one here right now, what we're getting, especially with the blowback from it is, wait, this advertised to me, it was a civil war. I thought I was going to see a war movie with a political ideology. That's right. what I paid my ticket for. I am upset that I did not get what I wanted. That's the Kevin Costner movie. That's yeah, kind of I'll put it to you this way. That's not the relationship that art has with its audience. Art is not made for you. It's made for the artist. And if it resonates with you, that is the victory. Right. I don't know. I like Thomas Kincaid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, I actually just mentioned uh, domestic box office this weekend, uh, 25.7 million. That's A24's uh, biggest grossing weekend, uh, opening weekend for any of its films. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens next week. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, going on, a, a rumble rant from Decade Pigeon support, uh, supporter uh, for Buck. Uh, as a teacher, I can't get other teachers, admins, counselors, or parents to put the students' phones away. Uh yeah, my daughter's school has a strict policy, no phones. Well, you know, Jonathan, I, I, I've been reading a lot of Jonathan Haidt and watching his stuff. Jonathan Haidt is a professor at NYU that's talking a lot about this. And part of, he talks a lot, he equates the fact that cell phones, smartphones became a fixture in schools around 2012, 2013. And what's happened is it's focused the attention of students on, they're more interested in their phones than mm -hmm. than focusing on learning. And we're seeing results of that all over the place. And it, it's not, look, I think it's a it's a bad thing, but it's because, you know, no one is making a stand. Like, why would you, the idea that I would have a phone in school that I would look at, I had no reason to talk to anybody when I was in school except what was going on in school. You know, and, and, and if somebody couldn't talk to me, if I'm getting a text from a friend of mine in another classroom in my classroom, why would that be happening? I mean, I can't even imagine, and that's par for the course now. It's that's all anybody does. How do you focus on anything? How do you focus on learning? How do you focus on concepts? How do you focus on on any subject when you have a phone that's constantly distracting you? Well, the biggest problem for it for a teacher today is dealing with the parents. That's certainly, yeah. and that's I mean, a byproduct it, of parents uh, today who are actually felt like they were um, victims in school because the teachers didn't side with them or the parents were up or the parents of the teachers were working against them. So when they became an adult, they're like, well, screw that. I'm not siding with the teacher. I'm going to defend my kid mm -hmm. because I should, I needed that defense when I was a kid and I wasn't getting it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, the, the issue with parents has been there a very long time. It's to me, cell phones are an alternative form of engagement. You know, the, the fact yep. that kids are not engaged in yep. what's happening in the class. That they they would much rather engage now with what they're used to, and it's whatever they happen to be uh, looking at on their phones, whether it's texting friends, watching TikToks. Um, you know, that's you know they they're being engaged constantly, and and they're able to choose now uh, at the detriment of education. 
Well, and that's the problem because at the end of the day, they're wondering, look, we haven't seen the results. You're looking at a generation of people that have only had smartphones for 15 years, not even quite 15 years. Where are we going to be in 10 years or 15 or 20 years from now? Mm -hmm. You know, where to be employed and they'll still be looking perfect. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's <laughs> that, I mean, I'm glad working in Hollywood, you know, you're directing you're there's nobody younger that is threatening anymore. <laughs> I can I can grow up to be an old man and not worry about it. I, I I was on some board and someone's like, yeah, you know, I know Nikita because La Femme Nikita is coming out. I know the Peta Wilson series. I never saw the original. I didn't realize it was originally a French <laughs> film. I saw it. It was kind of boring. I didn't like it. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's funny. All right, uh, Justin Channels. Uh, they want the degree. But not the education. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah. happening in Hollywood too. I think uh, you know we one of our WGA informants tells us that you know they're developing a project and they wouldn't push the project forward unless they took on a diverse co-writer. Uh, and that Which, uh, that's that's being phased out because um, yeah. when the Hollywood Reporter interviewed a bunch of uh, I, I strain to call them writers because they're not. Yeah. But they're not getting work. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's the reason. That was the design that the yeah. WGA did. They knew but, there's no way to get rid of these quotas um, without putting in some sort of um, incentive for them to get it. And basically, it's like saying, well, if we know that you write and you don't make the show money, we are not going to hire you. And it doesn't yeah. matter what your skin color is or ideology is. This is what we want. And this is a painful process. It's going to occur over the next two years in right. Hollywood because it's going to take that long to purge them out. And yeah. I think Hollywood, the studios are very correct in cutting a half, cutting the show orders in half because it's like we just want the best. We need to make money. We need to spend our money wisely. And the people yeah, but my, are, my, my point in that story was that that diverse writer was looking for the title. They were the co-writer of this. And yeah, then they yeah. take that title and get a bigger job out of it that they're not qualified for. And it, well, it, that's it, what we're seeing a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people just you. want the name and the title, the recognition, but not necessarily, again, the education, which is the skills, or the, the ability to do the work, you know, grinding it out, going through, you know, boot camp, so to speak, and just leveling yourself all the way up to being great. People just want to get the five, you know, the microwave version of this career, whatever it is. OK, I can get a quick degree and then I can go in the, the, this field, that field, and I can start making the money. And they just want to level up instead of, you know, like actually doing the work. That's like the big thing that I that I agree with with this statement. Yeah, they want to get to the finish line without realizing the value of the race. Mm -hmm. Yep. The race. <laughs> OK, uh, <laughs> Justice Film, DA is cooking. Can you smell what DA is cooking? <laughs> All right. Uh, from uh, Rumble, A.D. Ellis, school stopped teaching kids how to think and instead focused on teaching them what to think. Uh, that is just the basic brainwashing. And there's no more vulnerable group to manipulate than kids. Uh, yeah, very true. Uh, yeah, I can go off on that one for a very What's long time. The Floyd song? What was that? Oh yeah, uh, Lord Botha. My student, uh, my students think a five-page paper uh, they've had all year to write is a long paper. I know. <laughs> I, I, I ask my quiz. daughter all the time. Are you? <laughs> Man, are you I can tell you stories right now, boy. My kids in paper. <laughs> in high school, I had to write a ten thousand word essay. Right, <laughs> and that was a yeah. really yeah. Thing. Yeah. Was like a novella. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just have AI so I, it, right? Chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had to write a in my senior year a hundred uh, page paper on uh, how good a president Ronald Reagan was, and we had to we had to go down each you know uh, you know what was it uh, commander in chief all the roles that a president plays, and we had to look we had to research it, and whatever side you fell on, that's the side you fell on. Ag president. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a serious man for two dollars. Thank you. Uh, fun meetup Tuesday. Did Chris meet somebody? Yes, he met someone who. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, come join us Wednesday, and, and we'll we'll get an update on Chris. Uh, film threat, Rumble Rain, a decade pigeon supporter for a dollar. Thank you. The idea of journalism is actually a cover for perverse voyeurism. Uh, there are interested. They are interested in their own status and not the job or objective truth. Well, we as audience members are are perverts. Mm -hmm. by by default we love to watch yeah. so yeah i agree if they yeah. are journalism we are too like when we slow down at a car accident 
or when there's oh, a yeah. car chase on the news. I, I, but I, I don't, movies. I don't yeah. necessarily agree with with this, though. I mean, inter, their own status and not the objective truth. You know what? Here's the problem. Hmm. I think, you know, when I was growing up, and for me personally, I was always looking out at the world. Because there was no, I, there's no clout involved. It was something that I was interested in. My entire film interest, I had to go out in the world to, 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 to satisfy it. You had to go, go to films. You had to go to revival houses. You had to go to see everything. You couldn't, you couldn't just see movies whenever you wanted to. You had to make the effort. And I think that journalism. I've known. I mean, I took journalism in school. I was in high school. I was the feature editor of my newspaper, but mm-hmm. but it was it was about. It, it, journalists were truth seekers and they were truth seekers not for what they were going to get but they wanted to reveal the truth both to themselves and other people and i think if you look at the great movies about journalism sure there's some people that want to carry or they want to garner uh, uh accolades or whatever but for the most part great journal look at a movie like one of the great journalistic movies ever is zodiac you know, Fincher's Zodiac. I mean, that's an incredible film about people that were obsessed with solving the, the who is this killer and what what's going on here, not for fame and fortune, but for their own edification. They were obsessed with revealing a truth that was that was obscured. I just want to know, Robert, did you get a merit badge for being the uh, school editor, and was that on your way to the Eagle Scout? <laughs> no, I, I I did not. I, you know, I I I because I like I loved to write. You know, and I, I, I uh, took over. I was the film editor of my high school newspaper, and um, I'll tell you, to be honest, thanks to a woman named Louise Hathaway, there was a woman that used to see me at a bunch of screenings, and she was, uh, it was a very different kind of a thing. But up in Seattle, where I grew up, she would see me at these screenings, and she asked me why I was always at these previous screenings. I said, "Oh, I." She got me. Uh, she would lie and say that I was a syndicated writer from multiple high school newspapers, okay. which was absurd. So <laughs> she got me absurd. So she got me my first interview with a, a movie director, which was Martin Brest, who directed Beverly Hills Cop, the oh, original. Yes. Yeah. And and I got to write. I got to meet my first director uh, and interview him. And I interviewed him for my high school newspaper just because a woman, I don't know, recognized my enthusiasm. Shout out to Louise Hathaway. I don't know whatever happened to her of Thunder Media in Seattle. Uh, and that was 40 years ago, you know, this year when I was, I would have been uh, at this point in, uh, it, I would have been ending my junior year in high school. So shout out to her and recognizing something in me and getting me uh, my first interview with a film director. So. Nice. That was really nice. That's awesome. Uh, That's great. That's a great story. All right. From Aaron Taylor, speaking of journalism, uh, the biggest issue with Civil War was the lack of citizen journalists with cell phones. <laughs> Even without internet, all war zones are being captured today on cell phones. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know if it was Grant was out or what, because it did seem a little Last of Us, though, right, in, in this movie. Yeah, a little bit uh, apocalyptic. I mean, mm-hmm. what is the state of cell phone towers at that time? You know, uh, is it safe to go out on the street with your cell phone and capture everything? Well, they did have that moment Indeed. in the hotel that the Wi-Fi wasn't working well, and they had generators and stuff. And right. I will say this: Jesse was probably the closest to a citizen journalist because she wasn't really with the publication. Like the other guys, they claimed they were with Reuters, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she's she's just there reporting. So I mean, that that's the closest you can. But again, there's a lot of ambiguity going on with with uh, this film overall. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, MG, is there any actual good civ- American Civil War between the oh uh, the 1800 Civil War film? Asking as a non-American. Gone with the wind. Mm-hmm. Well, that wasn't actually in the war. It was kind of outside of the war. How about well, Glory? Glory, yeah, that was a good be Glory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, outside of that. I... How yeah, about... Right the good, bad, and the ugly. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, stuff like Gettysburg or oh, yeah, is... the North and the South. Oh, that's that was actually really good. That's a mini series. Mm-hmm. Really, I love that. How about Lincoln? The, the Beguiled. There you go. The Beguiled. Lincoln yeah. Spielberg's Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know that was a movie I didn't even want to watch, and I bought it. I own the Blu-ray, and I sat down and watched it. And I watched it all. I watched it every night for a week. Speaking of Twilight Zone, occurrence, I know it wasn't, but occurrence on Al Creek. Yep. Right? Yep. And then no, that, was, that was Twilight Zone. It was the one movie that was made outside of the auspices right. of, that they showed on the Twilight Zone. Yeah. Yep. 
And uh, I'll bring up uh, History of the World Part Two, which is now on Hulu. <laughs> oh, go! Don't do that. Are you, are you? Are you? Are you pitching? You got a sponsorship there? <laughs> All right, uh, for Regis Red for a Five Canadian. Um, thank you. I read this movie as Jesse dreaming of a being of dreaming of being a war journalist. Uh, I think it works well as Jesse's idea of war in journalism compared to the real thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll mention it. it did feel like there was a dream like quality to it, to the to the storytelling, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think there was a moment where I did think, is this someone's dream or not? Uh, and it was Jesse. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I see where you got there. Emmanuel Mendoza for five dollars. Awesome. Uh, uh, here we go. Uh, fuck the microwave. Bring out the slow smoker. <laughs> oh yeah. When it, well, I mean, when it comes to developing your skill, you don't want to rush to the end. You gotta mm -hmm. work at it, exercise it. A lot of skills, you can learn all the basics really quickly, but to master them is what takes time. And that's the point. Yeah. No one wants to spend time failing or making mistakes. That's how. Yeah. Not anymore. In day and age Not of anymore. social media where you can just be a star like at that fast, you know, if your something goes viral or whatever, that's what they're trying to get to. They're trying to get to the end instead of going on the journey. And that's, yeah, like I said, they're trying to microwave their careers instead of, yeah, take your time, you know, slow bake it. The problem is you don't learn that, how to do what you need to be doing. Yeah, I was like, I had yeah. lunch with a friend yesterday who yep. made a horror film in two weeks, uh, wrote it in two weeks, made it in 10, and uh, he, he made money on it. Great. Wow. Make 10 of those. Make 10 of those horror films. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he's still making movies. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, good. Right. that's great. All right. Changer of Ways. Beep, bop, boop for $2. I'm sick of hero journeys, uh, journos in... Hero journos in film, almost read that wrong, in real life, most suck. But you know what? This The journalist is the cause for someone else dying in, in many cases in this film. So Yeah. yeah I'm not, I have to say I this don't think there was any heroes in this. Was it? Was no. anybody a hero? No. No. They were, yeah. They were I mean, I'll say this about the, we, we talked about the Jesse character and the scene in the car. And I, I just felt like that that just was a revelation of her character being this, you know, adrenaline junkie. Uh, who who lived by the uh, you know the danger of journalism, so to speak, and that she put herself in yeah. these dangerous positions, and that that was a reflection on her behavior at the end of the movie. Um, so I, I chalk it up to a uh, a character you don't like, but it was meant to for you to not like that person. Uh, and then lastly, here we have uh, Mister Back Butt Crack Media. Remember for fourteen my uh, fourteen months. Uh, hey, Chris, and hello to all the guest panelists. Oh, so that's for all of us. Thank hello. You. Thank you. So Thanks. let's do this. We're going to wrap things up, but uh, let's get our uh, let's get our final uh, final comments. What your final point, uh, Derek? Why don't you start us off? Um. You know, I just I, I I think this is a good film once again for people to go watch. You know, even if it's just one time. And just see how you feel coming out on the other side of this. It's, again, it's it's because of what's happening now. I don't think it's necessarily a great movie outside of this current era, but in this era, I think it's a it's a it's a good movie to watch. It's a very I don't want to say it's important because I don't I don't want to put too much on it, but I think people should go and see this film. A lot of people haven't, and they're reacting to commentary about it and what they know about it. I wish people would go and watch this movie and then come up with your own conclusions because and then try as 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 hard as it can be. You know, I try to walk into every movie, even movies I think I'm gonna hate. And I say, All right, let me just walk in here, blank slate. Let me see what the filmmaker has for me. He may have something good, he may have something bad. I don't know until I watch it. Just walk in with a blank slate, open mind. See what it is. And in my opinion, you're not wrong. However you feel about it, you're not wrong. If you like it, if you hate it, if you think it's, you know, pedantic, if you think it's amazing, it doesn't matter. If you, you know, go in with that open mind, just get the feel of this film. I think it's a it's a good conversation starter about what's happening in the world today and how people, you know, like we've been all over the world with this conversation. You know, we've talked about education and cell phones and, you know, everything <laughs> else. So I think it kind of sparks a lot of different conversations and you know that's kind of my last take on it just go see the film and see what it does to you and 
you know, if it does nothing, okay, then it does nothing. But if it does something to you, you know, continue that conversation, you know, with friends and family. And, you know, don't think that we're heading towards a civil war. I don't think we're doing that. Get outside, start talking to people. You'll find the world is completely different than the world that they had in this film. Or the world is portrayed on social media and in the media. And the world on social media. Bingo. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. Regardless of how I feel personally about the film, go see the film in the theater. Like David Lynch says, don't watch it on your fucking phone. (laughs) Go to the theater. It's great sound design. I think experience the filmmaking, experience cinema. I think as uh, Robert Meyer Burnett said perfectly, we're in a great time for movies, believe it or not. I think this is worthy of your time to investigate, but go see it and go see it in the cinema. Great sound design. I think Kirsten Dunst and the young, what's her name, Callie, Callie's family. Yeah. Great, great performances. Excellent performances. Even um, uh, her husband, right? Uh, who's Jesse in that. Jesse Clemens. Fantastic, right? Great. Oh, that was a great scene. There's some yeah. great moments in that film. Really great moments. For me, it doesn't add up to a great film. It's a good film, but I think it's worth your time. Yeah. All right. I mean, I second that. I would say that, you know, whether a film works for you or whether it doesn't work for you, if a film gets you to think, if a film engages you on some level, it has value. And I, I, I look, I love going to a movie, coming out with friends, sitting down for a meal afterwards or a drink and, and talking about the movie. You know, it's it's kind of like uh, Patricia Arquette in True Romance. You know, you have a piece of pie and uh, you talk about the movie. <laughs> and I yeah. think that having a movie movie these days uh is and that can have this kind of a conversation shows that it has to be worth something and so much the better and as long as you're engaged and and you know you don't just let entertainment mindlessly wander in one ear and out the other then you're 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 doing okay so i think this movie has something to say and it'll be interesting to see how people it'll be interesting to see how this is thought about in the next year and five years and ten years Hmm. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think it's definitely a movie worthy of of your time. Uh, yes, go see it into a theater because even if you might not like it as a whole, it does have portions of it, which I'll call vignettes, that are actually really interesting and fascinating and you feel happy that you saw them. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That is what's there. And I also think that you get different types of performances that you weren't expecting and you get ideas presented to you that, um, may not be of the focus of what a civil war is or, or what is um, or the conflict re- regarding that, but it's just different ideas. And it's also nice to see uh, a story about journalists being what journalists are supposed to be, which is just recording the information objective and not trying to skewer a particular propagandistic narrative on top of it. They're there to capture what's going on. They're there to ask questions of certain people and that's it. They don't want to do anything further. And if they did, that's not in the movie. So you could always point to, hey, why aren't you being like this person? Like we've seen what journalists are. This is what's on screen, what they're supposed to be doing, not what we see over here on you know, television or, or Twitter or YouTube or Rumble or whatever platform you're watching it on. I think that's important because if we, if we don't have anything to reinforce what the idea of that position is, then we're never going to remember wh- why it was valuable in the first place and why the the horrible things that are happening to it now are important to be pointed out and, and called out for. Mm-hmm. So that's, those are my thoughts. And I think civil war at least accomplishes that. Yeah. I, I'll just say uh, a uh, thank you to our mods, Lord Thoth and Latino slant. Uh, Polly will be joining me on Wednesday, right? Polly. And uh, thank you for modding. Uh, Ms. P coffee, uh, Chris in the background, texting me notes. Uh, as the show goes along and uh and i'll just say um what i love about movies uh the best movies to me are the ones that uh that i connect with even if i disagree with it vehemently uh the ones that i connect with understand engage with uh to me that's the reason to go to the movies and as we we all say see in a theater because you need you know that communal experience uh there's nothing like it especially when watching a movie so with that hey everyone go around the horn tell us uh how we can see you, how we can get uh, all your socials, all that stuff. Uh, Derek, go for it. Uh, yeah. So uh, on Twitter, I'm trying to get better at Twitter. I'm not very good at it, but uh, Derek B. Writing. Um, and then you can find me on uh, YouTube, Derek Anderson, the DA. Uh, definitely come and check me out. Appreciate that. All right. Let's get Ramesh for a second. Uh, Script Doctor. 
yeah, you can find me on YouTube at script at uh, youtube.com slash script doctor, where every Saturday I do a uh, show with a special guest where we have read a screenplay that week. And we talk about it without spoiling the, the crux of the ending and try to encourage people to seek out um, other screenplays and things in uh, that are being circulated around. Uh, we give great commentary on that as well. We just had a great show last week um, about a comedy script and comedy scripts are out there. We just need to encourage the studio system to start investing in them again. Uh, so you can find that there and you can find me on YouTube, on Twitter, X at uh, script doctor PhD. All right, Ramesh. Oh, uh, I like to make things and sometimes I like to post the things I make um, on Instagram, speaking of journalism and getting the best shot at uh, Bon Iyer. And um, hopefully I can post something soon. I just worked on a new Hulu TV show and we were across the stages from the bear. So I got to take great pictures of the <laughs> sign that said, do not enter the stage. Uh, so <laughs> other than that, yeah, this is great. And thanks for having me on. <laughs> and Robert. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at uh, The Burnett Work. Find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. And I'm getting ready. Uh, we're finishing up a new feature called White Devils, but I'm getting ready to launch. I'm producing a fully immersive 10-episode audio drama that is based on the works of Max Allen Collins, who wrote the graphic novel that Road to Perdition is based on. But we're adapting his 19-novel series uh, about Detective Nathan Heller, who began his career as a bent cop in Chicago in the 1930s, early 30s, and he became a private investigator. We're, we're adapting the first book in the series. It's 10 episodes. It stars Todd Stashwick, who you might know as Liam Shaw from Picard Season 3 or Deacon from the 12 Monkeys TV series. And I just, uh, we're going to do, we're, we're making the show anyway, anyway, but we're crowdfunding it as well. I just added today a new cast member. I can't tell you who it is, but it's somebody who I've loved since the 80s. And um, somebody who's actually playing the Chicago mayor, Anton Cermak, who was in real life assassinated. And uh, the first case book, the first uh, show that we're doing is the assassination of Anton Cermak. And the person who's playing Anton Cermak, I'm very excited to have him on board. Is Ooh, Eddie Murphy? Right? This sounds Eddie cool. Murphy. Yeah, it's pretty neat, and and I just got uh, the the first script for the first episode that Max wrote is just so good, and I'll be directing and producing that, and we're going to launch a crowdfunding campaign probably within a week. Nice. It's All called right. True Noir: The Nathan True. Heller Case Books. Excellent. And I'm Alan Ng. Uh, you could find me on filmthreat.com. Uh, we have uh, movie reviews there. Uh, also, you could get me on my pal Alan on X. And uh, we have Hollywood on the Rocks coming up Wednesday and then the Film Threat Livecast with reviews on Friday. And uh, in, and I'm pretend I'm Tony Khan from AEW Wrestling. Uh, we have a big announcement about Chris on Wednesday. And uh, we'll leave it at that. So with that, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm.